Paul, when you arrived, the whip was the major issue, although, of course, in the great realms of things, the levy was far more important. Um, the whip also, for me, interlinks with the changes in the Grand National as well. Um, have we come to the stage where we have to stop giving in and defend the sport and make a stand? And I don't think the BHA personally has given in. And I, I think what's really important as a sport is taking a strong leadership position about welfare in the sport. And I think as a sport, we should be very confident and you know, proud of actually what's happening in the sport in terms of the way that we look after, you know, the way that we deal with welfare issues, both human and equine. Um, in respect of the Grand National, um, we recently announced you know, some minor changes to the Grand National. I think what we strove to do there, and we will continue to strive to do, is actually maintain the race, maintain the fabric of the race. Um, and I think that start, changes to the starting procedures and parading procedures and those sorts of things are really incidental in the actual running of the race. So what was important for us was to not lose the fabric of the Grand National. Um, in terms of the whip, I think we're in a reasonably sensible position and certainly it did occupy, um, as you know, a lot of my time when I first arrived. Um, at the time, that was, I, I, it was a little bit of a challenge, but having said that, it was actually you know, I look back on that now and think how fortunate I was to actually have a key issue to deal with and get my teeth into straight away. Um, and I think if you look at the stats, you know, over the course of the last nine to 12 months, we've, we've virtually halved, well, we have halved the number of hits that are allowed, yet the number of breaches is down by over a third. So, you know, the, the riders have to contend with half the number of allowable hits, yet they've been able to fall well into line and, you know, mark, full marks to them. And we've seen a significant decrease in interference, um, which co has coincided with a reduction in the use of the whip. So I think we're in a reasonably sensible position. But I absolutely take your point, and I think it's contingent upon us, to actually be quite proud of the things that we do in the sport and stand up and defend our position. Um, you know, we're constantly in debate with what I'd call credible welfare bodies, um, like World Health Welfare and the RSPCA. We certainly don't agree with them on everything and we stand our ground. And I think increasingly we, we do that by way of facts and data and actually being proud of a lot of things that we do in the sport. And, you know, we'll continue to do that. So very much comes a point where you're listening and you'll always listen as every governing body has to do and should do. But, but equally, there is a point when you have to say, actually, what we're doing is, is really good. You may not agree with it, but it's actually really good. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if you, know, if you look at the way that thoroughbred horses are looked after generally, you know, I mean, within this country, the programs that are in place and, and the way that the horses are looked after are fantastic. I mean, they're world class and we should be really, you know, we should be really proud of that. So we do consult with them. We do listen to them. Um, you know, but consultation doesn't necessarily mean agreement. And I think that, um, you know, their responsibilities are quite different to ours. Our responsibility is to make decisions in the best interests of British racing as a whole. Um, and part of that will be to defend where necessary our position on welfare. And, and I think generally, you know, we're in a pretty strong position. I know you've had meetings on horse welfare at Cheltenham and Aintree recently. What do you discuss at those? Well, the main, main focus of that discussion is actually just about alignment between BHA and Aintree and Cheltenham uh, around welfare issues, around planning for the two major festivals. And obviously both of those courses have new management in place. So for us, it was as much an opportunity to, you know, to sit down with the new management, understand their ideas, but particularly around messaging and communications, who's responsible for what on a race day. Um, so, you know, those, sometimes those things are slightly grey areas. So, but for us, it was as much about, you know, sitting down with the new management as anything. What happens? Worst case scenario, a couple of horses pass away in the Grand National. What happens then, Paul? Well, I think that will depend on the circumstances if that were to, to happen. But I think, you know, what, our role is actually really about preparation and risk management. And then, you know, the circumstances that play out on the day um, are largely but not solely dependent on our, on our preparation and the risk management procedures that we've got in place. Can and we overplay the safety part of the race and perhaps not play up enough the fact that we are warning people this is 
dangerous. I mean, you know what I mean? No, I no, I do. If you go Absolutely. and watch an 18 film, there's uh, an 18 film that says it's 18 yeah, registered. Now, I'm not saying we put up a safety number, but, but what I'm saying is, you know, shouldn't we tell people that this is actually like motor racing, a sort of dangerous sport? Well, I think that's, I think that's right. And part of that is about the balance. Um, you know, so we don't encourage anything, you know, that puts anyone at risk. But the fact is that, you know, jumps racing has some risks in it. I mean, flat racing has some risks in it. And the, the Aintree, at Aintree, over the Grand National Course, that obviously has, um, you know, a different set of risks attached to it. So it's, it's not risk-free. We don't pretend it is. And to be honest, the, the test that it is and the, you know, its unique qualities is part of its appeal. It's a reason that it's, you know, it's part of, it's an iconic event in British sport. And, and part of that is because of what people see on the race day and, and what takes place over those fences. So um, we don't want to water that down. And I think, um, you know, part of its appeal is, is everything that's attached to it now. It's, as I said, it's an iconic event. We don't want to water it down. And the final question on the Grand National, um, and all of these things are subjective from a personal point of view, but how close did you get, do you think, to having a smaller field than 40, which seems to be the one area that when all the changes were made, people were saying, oh, I thought they might make it 35 or 30. How close were you to doing that this time? Look, that's probably the, that's probably the one um, issue that comes up the most, or the question that gets asked um, the, uh, the most, is the field size issue. Um, how close did we get? I've got to say, actually, not that close. Um, because, to be honest, again, we were keen to retain a lot of the, um, you know, the, I guess, the individual elements of that race. Um, it's... It's not BHA's race in a way. I mean, it's very much Aintree's race and, you know, we have a supporting role to them, but we work very closely with them around the construct of, you know, the construct of the field and the conditions of the race. Um, look, I think it's an issue that people will continue to focus on, but um, at this stage, statistically, we didn't, we didn't have any great compelling reason to reduce the field size, so we, we actually didn't come that close to reducing it. When we look to the future, there appear to be lots of positives as long as you keep steering the ship as the way you are. Um, well, I'm probably not the right person to judge that, actually. It's probably for others to judge. But, you know, I think... Well, we I'll are judging, Paul, and, and people feel that you've arrived and there is a chance that British racing will have a proper future, which a lot of people in racing never felt before you came. Well, it, you know, that's that's, fact. It's, it's nice to know that, that that view may be held in some parts. You know, I think my role... You know, my role and the role of the BHA, you know, as I've said lots of times, I'll continue to say it's about leadership and service. You know, I'd love to have more levers at the BHA at my disposal than I do. Um, fact is that we don't. So how do you work in an environment where you don't have all of the levers? You know, it's not a vertically integrated model like you have in Australia or Hong Kong or elsewhere. Um, it's hugely complex. Um, it is factionalised to an extent, um, sometimes to a large extent. So, you know, a lot of it is about working with other people in the sport. You know, Rod sits not 10 metres from me in our office and we have a really good working relationship. And I think we're clear about what each other's responsibilities are and we respect that. Um, so part of it is about building relationships. Um, I'm really enjoying, you know, my role, to be honest, which I think is, which is important. I, I love the sport, as you know. Um, How long is your contract? None, I, um, well, are you able to tell us? Uh, well, actually, I can tell you my visa, I can, you know, as an Australian, I can only get a three-year visa. Right. Um, but that's not to say that it can't be extended if that's the wishes of, the, of my employer. As long as I'm enjoying it, um, you know, and that's always been the main thing. And at the moment, I'm really enjoying it. So, so long as, you know, so long as Jackie and I are, uh, you know, are enjoying our time over here and I feel that I can continue to make a contribution to the sport, then, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I love it. I think the racing here is fantastic. I think there's huge challenges. Um, and most of those are not dealt with um, by any sense. So, yeah, for the moment, I'm really enjoying it.